Well, hello, Christ Covenant. Uh, my name is Drew Martin, and it's my great pleasure today to share with you a little bit about the life and ministry of Francis Grimke, uh, one of the most important and, uh, in many ways, underappreciated uh, ministers and theologians of the 20th century. So I'm really excited uh, for the opportunity to share with you today. And uh, before I dive in, I did just want to introduce myself. Um, you have met before and know somewhat well my co-pastor here at West Charlotte Church, Charles McKnight. He's come and spoken a number of times, um, but I haven't yet had the opportunity to come and, and share with you. And so I just wanted to begin by saying thank you so much for your prayers and support. We are so grateful um, for Mike Miller and um, Brent Anderson and Karen Chambers and so many others of you who've been so supportive of our church plant over in West Charlotte. We are your great granddaughter church and we would not be here without your legacy and honestly your support. So thank you for that support. Wanted to begin by saying that. Uh, also wanted to begin by saying uh, we are so grateful uh, for the ministry of Christ's covenant in general. Uh, I I'm sure that the Lord uh, has a plan. I know that. I believe it. Uh, but the way that his plan has worked out in my life is that I am in the PCA in large part because of the ministry of Christ's covenant. When my wife, Meg, uh, was in high school, she began coming to the youth group at Christ's covenant. And then in college, she went to a PCA church when we were students together at UNC Chapel Hill. And because she was going to a PCA church, I began going to a PCA church, and so it was actually your legacy of drawing her in that ended up drawing me in. So I am so grateful for you personally uh, in my own life, in addition to being grateful for the support that you've given to our church. So it's a great honor and privilege to be able to share with you today, and I want to dive right in. Uh, we're going to be talking about Francis Grimke this morning, and the first thing to think about is why is Francis Grimke so important? So let me share with you a little bit about that. Uh, Charles and I, Pastor Charles and I, have been, sh have been reading about Francis Grimke now for some time. Uh, and so when Blair Smith reached out to us uh, to share about him with you, we were so excited. Um, I just want to say thank you, Dr. Smith. Thanks, Blair. We appreciate you inviting us. Uh, one of the reasons that Blair reached out to us is that uh, Kevin DeYoung recently had connected us with some folks at Crossway uh, about doing a book on Francis Grimke about his practical uh, way of living the Christian life, his counsel and advice for how we should live as Christians. And so we've been talking with them, and as a result, we've been diving even deeper into Francis Grimke. And so I just want to say thank you, Kevin, and to say that's part of the background for how I personally became interested in Francis Grimke. Um, but I, I want to share about Francis Grimke with you, not just because I personally am interested in him, but he is actually a really, really important and underappreciated figure in the history of Christianity in America, and in particular, in the history of Reformed and Presbyterian Christianity in America. Uh, until recently, uh, his name had sort of fallen into obscurity. Um, but over the last few years, people have once again been reading his written works, and they've been giving them the attention that they deserve. Uh, <laughs> one reason for that is that in 1918, in the middle of that Spanish flu epidemic, he wrote a fascinating work on how Christians should respond to a global pandemic. And that uh, uh, article that he wrote has been getting a lot of airtime on the internet recently. A lot of pretty helpful things in there, actually pretty relevant for 2020. So some of you may actually have seen that and through that become familiar with Francis Grimke. But one of the other reasons that he has become rediscovered recently is that he wrote a lot on how to preach, um, meditations on preaching. And he was a very gifted communicator, very gifted preacher, well-known and well-respected preacher. And so uh, a lot of seminary students are now reading that book and, and some of the insights from that book are starting to trickle down into our churches. And so there's another reason that you may have heard about Francis Grimke. Uh, by all accounts, he was a very gifted preacher and teacher. And so uh, both of those two works that I just mentioned have contributed to some renewed interest in Francis Grimke. But the real reason, I think, that people are starting to rediscover Grimke now has even more to do with the much-needed and much-overdue realization 
by mainstream Americans and by mainstream academic scholarship that the story of African American Christianity in America is much bigger, much more interesting, and honestly much more important than we have often been led to uh, to believe in the past. Uh, We are starting to realize how important it is to tell American history in a way that gives credit where credit is due. And we're starting to realize how important African American Christians have been to the pursuit of freedom and the proclamation of the gospel in this country. And so I I think that Francis Grimke's part in that story um, and his significance is one of the reasons, perhaps the main reason that people are starting to discover him now in this present moment. So uh, I do wanna say that church history that neglects to tell the whole story is deficient history. It's not good church history. And the neglect of figures like Francis Grimke calls out to us to recognize just how deficient some of our history telling has been. How could one of the most well-known and prominent pastors in America be forgotten so soon after his life? Uh, Grimke was the pastor of the 15th Street Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C. for 50 years. Uh, The famous uh, historian of African-American Christianity, Charles Woodson, collected and published four volumes of Grimke's works in 1942. And those works contain only just a fraction of all the things that Grimke wrote. Um, His essays and his articles were published widely and they were regularly commented on by notable figures. He corresponded uh, with various presidents, Roosevelt, Taft, Wilson. Uh, He was a close personal friend of Frederick Douglass, even officiated his wedding, Um, and he was intimately connected with some of the most important social activists of the 20th century, including Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois, as well as abolitionists like William Lloyd Garrison and others. So, Uh, He was just a really significant and influential figure for all those reasons. And in addition to those, uh, he was a longtime trustee of Howard University, and he was looked to in many ways as a de facto leader among African-American Christians in the first half of the 20th century. Um, He was regularly invited to speak by a host of institutions, organizations, and events. Um, He was a famous pastor and public theologian. And so the fact Um, that he has been forgotten, tells us just a little bit about how church history in America has been told. And it points us in the direction of where we need to go in order to tell it better. Um, So it's important for history's sake to remember Francis Grimke properly. But I would also argue that it is important for our sakes um, to remember Francis Grimke because he both taught and embodied some truths that are not only crucial for the ministry of the church, the ministry of the gospel, but they're also relevant to our present cultural moment. Uh, Francis Grimke captured these truths so well in a letter that he wrote to the alumni of Princeton Theological Seminary in 1918. I I think this quote captures the spirit of this entire um, talk that I'm giving you today, and so I want to read it and I hope you would enjoy it as much as I do. This is what Grimke said in 1918. After 40 years of ministry, he said, during these 40 years, two things I have tried to do with all my might, to preach the gospel of the grace of God and to get people to see their need of a savior and to accept of Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life. If I had to live my life over again, I would still choose the ministry. I could not be satisfied in any other calling. And two, I've sought with all my might to fight race prejudice because I believe it is utterly unchristian and it is doing almost more than anything else to curse our own land and country and the world at large. Christianity in its teachings and in the spirit of its founder stands for the brotherhood of man, and it calls us to do by others as we would be done by, to love our neighbors as ourselves. That quote captures Francis Grimke's passions so well. And the Lord used his life experiences in order to bring him to those realizations. So I want to share with you just a little bit about his life this morning. And that quote also points to the centrality of 
of the preaching of God's gospel and God's law. And so the, the primary thing I want to share with you today is actually the way in which Francis Grimke held on to both the law and the gospel, distinguishing them, but hanging on to both. Um, so that's the main thing that I want to talk to you about today is how he unpacked that. Uh, but then brief, briefly, I do want to share just a couple quick reflections on how um, he thought of the church's mission and then how that led him to think about partnering for social good with non-Christians, unbelievers, and other organizations. So hopefully we can do all of that in 45 minutes. We're going to see how well we can do. Let's dive right in. Uh, so first, we're going to begin with Francis Grimke's biography, just his story and some of his experiences, how they shaped him. Uh, Francis Grimke was born in 1850 on a plantation just outside of Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, his father was Henry Grimke, uh, who was the owner of the plantation, and his mother was Nancy Weston, who was a biracial slave. Uh, Nancy became Henry's mistress after his wife Selina died, and then they had three sons. So uh, Henry Grimke had uh, white children through his original marriage, but then after his wife died, he and Nancy had three sons, including Francis, uh, but also his older brother Archibald, who we'll talk about a little bit, and his younger brother John. Uh, according to uh, Henry Justin Ferry's 1970 Yale dissertation, um, which, by the way, is one of the best works out there on Grimke. There's books about uh, uh, Francis Grimke's famous abolitionist sisters. There's a book about Archibald Grimke. Um, there's books about the family in general. Um, but it just is, it, it boggles the mind that there's not a book about Francis Grimke yet. Uh, but there is a really wonderful dissertation. Uh, and in that dissertation, uh, Ferry argues um, that though South Carolina law prohibited their marriage, uh, Nancy not only became Henry's mistress, but she also functioned as the de facto uh, mistress of the plantation. Um, and she was looked to for advice and counsel, um, not uh, from people on the plantation in general, but from Henry in particular. Um, so nevertheless, uh, she and her three sons, in spite of that, they continued to live in a small cabin that served as the slave quarters, and they did not live in the big house. Um, so needless to say, this was a very, very complicated relationship. And when Francis was two years old, life became even more complicated uh, when his father Henry died of yellow fever. And South Carolina law at the time uh, prohibited the manumission, the freeing of slaves upon the death of their owners. So Henry had arranged in his will um, that the ownership of Nancy and the children would be passed on to Montague, who was one of his white sons, uh, through his, his marriage. So the plantation was sold. Uh, Nancy was given just enough money to purchase a tiny little three-bedroom, a uh, three-room house in Charleston proper. Um, so it's a small house with just three rooms. And um, technically, they were still slaves, but Nancy and the boys lived with a significant degree of freedom for the next eight years. Uh, Nancy earned money by laundering clothes. The boys helped her in the work. They worked really hard. They were poor, but they worked hard and they had what they needed. Um, South Carolina uh, law, again, prohibited schooling for blacks. Um, so Nancy made major sacrifices in order to earn enough money to provide private tutoring for her children. Um, the family attended a Presbyterian church with a strong ministry to children, and the boys learned the Bible at the church. Uh, but even though they learned the Bible at the church, if you read Archibald's uh, memoirs, it seems it was actually his mother's example, Nancy's example, her praying example, her example of devotion that left the strongest impression on the boy. She was a remarkable mother, and her example of prayer stood out to the boys throughout their life. Um, so Francis' childhood was hard, but the boys had a good home, and they learned the importance of faith in God and in hard work. That all changed in 1860 when Montague, who technically owned them, married Julia Emma Hibben, who had grown up on a plantation in Alabama, and she expected her husband to provide her with slaves to attend to her personal needs. So Archibald, age 11, and Francis, age 10, were taken out of their house from their mother to serve their half-brother's household. Just imagine. Uh, 
Um, when Nancy objected to this, uh, Montague had her thrown into a workhouse um, for a week, and she became so sick that she nearly died. Um, even at that age, the boys had such a strong sense of justice, they saw this happen, um, that they would not submit to such an immoral arrangement. And so they were beaten mercilessly um, and often for their acts, various acts of protest. Um, Archibald quickly escaped, um, and he lived in hiding until the end of the Civil War. This all took place in the early 1860s, so right before the Civil War. Uh, but it took Francis longer because he kept getting captured after his escape attempts, and he was beaten, and he was whipped. Um, he was locked in a room. Um, he was sent off to a notorious, notoriously harsh master to try to break him. Um, but none of that succeeded, and, and Grimke just had an incredible strength. And so he just withstood the, the treatment that he had um, time and time again, uh, stoically. Um, just remarkable strength for a 10-year-old 10-year-old boy. Um, we can only imagine how those years must have shaped him, how they must have affected him. Um, after the war, the boys were both emancipated, and they began attending some new schools that were set up for freed slaves. And they were noticed really quickly by one of their teachers. And she arranged for them to move, eventually move up north. She thought they were so promising, I'm gonna send them up north um, so they can be mentored and educated. So they began at Lincoln University, where um, Francis became the valedictorian of his class. So he's very bright, very capable student. Uh, Archibald went on to attend Harvard Law School. Um, and Francis uh, also briefly studied law at Howard University in Washington, D.C. But then he began to sense a call to the ministry. And so he moved to Princeton um, to attend Princeton Theological Seminary. And that's where he completed his studies. Uh, according to James McCosh, who was the president of Princeton College at the time, uh, Charles Hodge, uh, referring to Francis Grimke, uh, reckoned him as one of the most able of his students. So uh, he was not only a remarkable student at Lincoln College, but also at Princeton Theological Seminary. Uh, he graduated from Princeton in 1878, and he took a call to 15th Street Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C., where he would go on to serve for 50 years. He had this brief period that he was down in Florida while his wife was sick, but he served the church for 50 years. Um, and that same year, he married his wife, Charlotte, uh, Charlotte Fortin of Philadelphia. Uh, her family was well known for their social activism. And during his long ministry at 15th Street, Grimke became well known for his gifts in preaching. That's one of the things that really set him apart and made him famous. But he also served as a trustee for Howard University, as I mentioned a bit ago. Um, he did that alongside his uh, brother Archibald and um, along Archibald and W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, he was one of the uh, people who helped to found the NAACP. Um, and in addition to all of those things, he was, he was just at the foundation of uh, what would ultimately become the civil rights movement. He was actively involved uh, in so many of the, um, the protests and uh, the organizations that developed into the civil rights movement. And it was his wisdom and success in those endeavors that led to all kinds of offers um, to him to teach as a professor, um, to lead different organizations. But, but Francis Grimke remained devoted to his congregation as a pastor at 15th Street Presbyterian Church, and he stayed in that church for 50 years, and he was with them day, week in, week in, uh, week out, day in, day out. Um, he refused to let all these other things to prevent him from performing his vocation as a pastor. It was his first love. This is what he wrote in his notebook. He said, the Christian ministry is no place for one who does not see that his supreme mission is to call people to repentance and faith and who is not fully determined to make everything else in his life subservient to that end. The kingdom of God in seeking the salvation of people must be first with him and must be kept first, high above every other interest. So for Grimke, being a pastor was his first love and his first calling. And by all accounts, he practiced what he preached, faithfully serving his congregation during, just think about the years in which he, he served, how turbulent, uh, how difficult a period of American history it was. It stretched from the years of Reconstruction and its collapse um, through the insidious rise of white supremacy in the South, through the First World War and the Great Depression, 
and then through the racial violence and lynching um, that violently characterized life in, in America in the first half of the 20th century. So he pastored through all of that in the middle of Washington, D.C. So that's just a little bit about Francis Grimke's story. But the, the heart of what I want to share with, with you all today has to do with the importance that he placed upon the law and the gospel. And so as we consider some of the central themes of Grimke's life and ministry, it's, it's his preaching, his emphasis in preaching, both the law and the gospel, that really stands out as one of the most important things about him. When it came to the gospel, uh, he expressed his concern in this way. He said, much is being said about what is necessary on the part of religion or the church to meet the demands of this modern scientific age. Uh, his response uh, emphasized that, yeah, the world has changed, uh, but the central need of humanity has not. For the great need of man in this age is the same as it has ever been. The need of salvation, he said, of being saved from the guilt and power of sin. So for Grimke, if, if humanity's central problem had not changed, then neither had the solution to that problem. He said, there's only one way of meeting that problem. That way was the one set forth in the inspired record in the scriptures of the Old and New Testament. <laughs> uh, to put it in the most simple and direct terms, the best way to meet humanity's central need, in quotes, is preaching the gospel. That is what we need most. And Grimke appealed to Paul's language in the New Testament to emphasize that this preaching of the gospel should be carried out in clear and understandable language, not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but rather in the demonstration of the spirit and power, he said. And then he went on, he concluded by affirming this full continuity uh, of the needs of the early church with those of his own day. Uh, the conditions of the early church were just as difficult as the present, and therefore the church's need in every age is to get a hold of the truth as set forth in the word of God and fearlessly and faithfully proclaim it. And so Grimke made all of those statements, all those claims about the gospel's centrality. He made them forcefully and he made them adamantly. There is no other way, and it would be foolish and futile to think that there is any other way that human beings can have a hope. We need the forgiveness of God. We need the grace of God, and we need the hope that comes from it. So, at the same time, though he recognized that the preaching of the gospel is what people need more than anything else, uh, Grimke elsewhere wrote that the church of his day uh, was too focused on other things. And he lamented that the gospel message of Jesus was either being taken for granted or was being forgotten. He said, we speak to people very seldom about their soul's salvation. And when we do, we do it as a general thing. It's done in such a perfunctory way that it shows that we have no real sense of the seriousness of the task to which we have set ourselves. Basically what he's saying is, how could it be possible that there is some, there's something so important and it could be taken so lightly? Uh, Grimke suggested that one answer to that question involved uh, an underestimation of the stakes. He said, we, we don't speak as if we realized the tremendous issue at stake, the issue of life and death, spiritual and eternal. For Grimke, if those who profess to believe the gospel genuinely realized the nature of the peril, apart from the person and work of Jesus, then we would live differently. Then we would speak differently. He said, we would approach people in a very different spirit. And we would not be content to speak with them only once. We would keep after them until they heeded the call. The church did not focus on the good news of the gospel enough because it didn't take seriously the reality of sin and judgment enough. And so therefore, for Grimke, it was essential for the church to reclaim the importance of preaching, not only the good news of the gospel, but it was also important to reclaim the preaching of the law um, so that God could help people to appreciate the beauty and the significance of the gospel message. Grimke was so critical of the church of his day for failing to appreciate the importance of preaching the whole counsel of God's law and for failing to call for repentance as a central aspect of gospel proclamation. 
In fact, in 1916, uh, the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church hosted an Institute for Evangelism at the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church. Um, so after that institute took place, Grimke gave an address where he expressed these concerns. And he said, the evangelism that is current in this country is ineffective uh, because it fails to include accepting Jesus Christ in the sense of adopting his standard of living, uh, his principles of conduct. And so Grimke made the demand that believers, um, if they're going to be genuine in their faith, if they're going to hear the proclamation of the gospel, um, that they also need to make an earnest and, and honest effort to conform the character and life to the spirit and teaching of Jesus Christ. We have to connect evangelism and discipleship, is what he's saying. And, and then he, he goes on, and, and his point is that preaching the gospel without preaching the need for repentance and commitment to following Jesus in all of life, that's preaching cheap grace. And the result is people, men and women, who come into the church through these evangelistic efforts who, he says, in the great majority of cases have no more idea or intention of doing what Jesus wants them to do except qualifiedly than they have of butting their heads against a stone wall. <laughs> um, in the society of Grimke's day, the preaching of cheap grace um, was often characterized by the failure to preach against the evils of racism. And as a result, converts of that kind of evangelism came into the church with a faulty understanding of the implications of the gospel for their lives as Christians. This is what, this is what he said, and this is a long quote, but I think it's helpful and it's powerful. He says, they come into the church and they bring with them all their color phobia. Their acceptance of Jesus Christ does not change in the least their attitude towards the Negro. Their prejudice towards him continues, just the same as before they made a profession of religion. And they don't feel, in accepting Jesus Christ, that a change in this regard is necessary, nor does the evangelism that is preached by the white people in this country assume that a change is necessary. It is an evangelism that makes them feel that they can still hold on to their prejudice and yet be good Christians, yet be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Evangelism of that kind is of no real value, counts for nothing in the sight of God. Evangelism of that kind is an insult to Jesus Christ. Accepting Jesus Christ in that way is nothing but sheer hypocrisy. Hypocrisy on the part of those who profess to accept and on the part of those who are content with that kind of acceptance. <laughs> you can see he used strong language, but it was a deep problem and it needed strong language for it to be addressed. So Grimke went on to point out that this problem was one that came from the top down. <laughs> one of the very people being considered to chair, to be the chairperson for the, for the denominational general evangelistic committee had expressed his view in a private conversation. Now just think about this. This is the person who's going to be the chair of evangelism for the denomination. And he said this, um, that he did not care to have anything to do with a colored man who felt that he was his social equal. <laughs> that was a person who was being considered for the chair of evangelism in the denomination at that time. Not only that, but racist attitudes were central to the very institutions that prepared pastors for ministry. Though Grinke championed his alma mater, he loved Princeton Theological Seminary, he said, it's not only the oldest, but it's the greatest of our theological schools. And he also championed J. Ross Stevenson, uh, who was the seminary's president, and he was the moderator of the General Assembly of the denomination. He, he, he celebrated him for his willingness to stand up and protest against the drawing of the color line in the church. But at the same time, he also had to point out that there was a blatant hypocrisy a racist hypocrisy that not only was tolerated at the seminary, but it was being allowed to grow. Uh, Grimke pointed out that when he himself had been a student at the seminary just 40 years previously, uh, actually, I mean, 40 years previously is a while ago, um, they should have made some progress since then. So when he was a student 40 years previously, he and some other students of color had been allowed to live in the dorms 
alongside the white students. But now, however, black students were not allowed in those same dormitories. So things had not only not gotten better at Princeton, they had gotten worse. And so with that kind of training for ministry, it's no wonder the church was failing to preach the whole counsel of God in calling people to faith and repentance. And Grimke felt it was important to point those things out. Notice how uh, careful he was in his words, respectful of the institution, respectful of the leader, but he didn't mince any words in calling out the problems in those institutions and calling the leaders to account for those. Um, that's a characteristic of Grimke's public, public speaking and public way of handling things. Very careful, very measured, um, but not moderate. He didn't mind calling out sin where there was sin. The main point is that proper evangelism needs to include a clear call to both repentance and faith. Um, the call for repentance should not ignore the most prevalent sins of the day. A proclamation of the gospel that did not include a rigorous declaration of God's law could not expect to result in genuine repentance and therefore could not expect to result in effective evangelism. Um, Grimke not only offered a critique of poor evangelistic proclamation, but he also took the time to carefully describe, on the other hand, okay, uh, the, what, what should we be doing? The positive description of what proper evangelistic communication of both the law and the gospel should entail. This is what he said. He said, there is an evangelism that is genuine, an evangelism for which the great Presbyterian Church in the United States of America should stand, but for which it does not stand, an evangelism that means accepting Jesus Christ in reality and not in pretense, an evangelism that carries along with it brotherhood, and so presents Jesus Christ that people see and see plainly what is involved in accepting him. So you can see that Grimke's understanding of gospel ministry was shaped according to his embrace of the trajectory that moved from guilt to grace to gratitude. The good news of the gospel, the good news of the grace of the gospel could not be appreciated without a fully orbed understanding of personal guilt. Only the person who truly recognized their need for forgiveness could begin to appreciate the depths of God's mercy. Similarly, the necessary response to the good news of that grace and forgiveness that we are not held accountable for those sins, the necessary response to that grace and mercy should lead to a, a life uh, uh, of gratitude, thankfulness to God for the forgiveness that we have received. Thankfulness for God's work of salvation should lead us to the enjoyment of God's ongoing work of making us holy, of sanctifying us um, in our daily lives. So gratitude to God leads to the joyful pursuit of personal holiness, not perfection, uh, but we know what we've been forgiven from and we know the grace we've received and therefore we want to live in response to that grace. So Grimke's trust in the scriptures led him to focus not only on the importance of the law's function as a mirror that shows me who I really am, that shows me my need for Jesus, but also upon the law's function as a guide to how we should live, to thankful living. He said, I believe in the Bible as the word of God, and therefore the work of the minister mainly is to expound it with a view of developing character of the type that's set forth in the scriptures. <laughs> he cited Paul's command to Timothy to rightly divide the word of truth. Um, and, and Grimke appealed to the Bible for its great truths and for its lofty ideals and principles and for its material for building up character of the noblest type. Those are all his words. Um, the proclamation and the work of the gospel should not only bring people to Christ, but should also develop them a Christly character. So Grimke characterized this joint task of evangelism and discipleship as the main business of the minister. And when he described the pastor who failed to carry out this joint task, Grimke did not mince any words. He said he is a failure, and the sooner he gets out of ministry, the better. So Grimke didn't mind saying it how it really was. So his trust in the scriptures led him to focus not only on the importance of the law, law's function as a mirror, but also as its role as a guide. And Grimke also liked to emphasize the faithfulness um, of the Christian life could not come 
apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not on our own strength, but God does the work in us. He said, human nature left to itself, it never can be made conformable to the law of God. In fact, no amount of education of human culture can ever make human nature to be other than it is or to lift it to the high level required by the character and laws of God. Human nature can't please God on its own. Not on natural or unaided capacity, no. Therefore, Grimke said, the work of the Spirit can't be ignored or minimized or relegated to a subordinate place. Every step of advancement towards the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ can come only as the Spirit is in the back of it. So for Grimke, the true Christian life ought to be marked by the fruits of good works. But Grimke was quick to point out uh, that those works themselves are the result of the fruits of the Spirit. It's the Spirit that does the work in us. Um, to make us holy. So just to summarize all of this, this main part uh, of this talk today, uh, Grimke located the preaching of the good news of the gospel in the center of the Christian ministry. And he distinguished, but he didn't separate, the gospel of grace from the proclama proclamation of God's law. God's law served not only to show sinners their need for a savior, but also to direct the believer in daily life. Um, and that life is to be lived as one of gratitude towards God and in dependence upon the Holy Spirit. So to, fa to fail to proclaim the whole counsel of God was to cheapen grace, to make evangelism ineffective, and to make discipleship deficient. And so, for Grimke, the white Christian church's refusal to address racism, that struck at the heart of the validity and the power of the church's ministry. And so that's something I think that we need to hear today. Are there ways in which we need to hear the same message that Francis Grimke preached to his own congregation and to the world at large? Um, is there a way that we need to hear that today? We need to think deeply about those things. Um, so before concluding, I do want to just share with you a few brief um, thoughts about a couple other points of emphasis in Grimke's ministry. One has to do um, with the way in which he emphasized the mission of the church as both gathered and scattered out into the world, and then how that led him to think about church partnerships. So here I'll, I'll be pretty brief. Uh, Grimke believed that the church's mission, when it was gathered together, was a spiritual mission. And time and time again, he talks about the spiritual nature of the church's mission. Basically, we uh, evangelize and we disciple. That's what we do. We worship. Uh, we bring people in, we disciple, and we worship God. That's what the church does gathered. But for Grimke also, it was important to emphasize that the church goes out into the world, that the church scatters. And as the church scatters, the church doesn't stop being the church. Um, the church takes uh, all of its beliefs with it out into the world. And so as people grow in maturity and depth in their understanding of what it means to be the to be a Christian, to be the church, as they go out into the world, they are they are salt and light in the world, and they can work for good in all sorts of ways. Um, so Grimke emphasized not only the spiritual nature of the church's mission, but also the fact that as believers go out into the world. Um, as they become more mature, they can be agents for good in the world. And so uh, as they're agents for good, they're not only agents for good spiritually, but they can actually be agents for good temporally, materially, um, in terms of the way that society functions. And so, yes, the church's mission is a spiritual mission, but as Christians grow, they can affect the world for good. And he emphasized both parts of that. Um, the, uh, basically, the ministry of the church gathered has a direct impact on the ministry of the church scattered. When the church gathered grows in maturity and depth, that church is also more effective in their work as the church scattered, and the church scattered can have a great influence in the world. Uh, he made that point throughout his, his ministry, but perhaps uh, one of the most powerful places that he made that point is in his uh, one of his more well-known works called Christianity and Race Prejudice. And you can find this on the internet if you'd like to read it. It's a really powerful work. Uh, but in that work, he directly addresses the church both as the church gathered and also as the church scattered. And he has really helpful thoughts for both. Uh, he knew 
that it was important to eradicate the color line. He used the phrase that Frederick Douglass made famous. We need to eradicate the color line in the church. But he also knew that if Christians were faithful in that pursuit, that it should carry over in their desire to erase the color line from society more generally. So here it's, it's very important to be clear about what the gospel does do, uh, but also about what the gospel does not do. Here talking about the gospel strictly. The gospel is the announcement of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us and the hope that we have if we believe in that. Um, the gospel changes our hearts and it gives us eternal life and therefore it gives us eternal hope. Uh, but the gospel strictly considered, talking about Jesus, what Jesus has done for us and the benefits of what he has done for us. Um, that, that does not uh, fix everything temporally. God is going to fix everything temporally one day. He's going to exercise judgment. He's going to return. And we have the good news and the hope that we will not experience the, that judgment because we've been forgiven in Christ. Um, but the gospel, the announcement of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done by itself doesn't fix everything in the world as we know it right now. Um, so just to illustrate that point a bit, I think we know this point, um, but just to illustrate it a bit, I think it might be helpful for us as we think about um, how Grimke talked about race to have in our minds the example of abortion. Uh, think about it. The gospel announces the judgment and mercy of God, and it reminds us that God is ultimately going to make all things right, and in fact that he's in the process of making all things new. And that does give us hope. It gives us hope when it comes to something as grievous as the issue of abortion, and because we know that God is going to vindicate. We know that God is going to set things right, um, that God has a plan uh, even for those unborn lives, and we can trust him for that. So there's some hope. And at the same time, while we wait for God with hope, um, we also know that there's forgiveness for us. And we also know that as those with gospel hope, um, those with changed gospel hearts, um, that we need to work to address the temporal injustices in this world with temporal measures. If we believe in God, and if we believe in what God says is good, then aren't we going to go and try to try to do something about it in the world around us? Um, so I praise the Lord that Christians have worked and are continuing to work to address the evil of abortion in the world and to, and to proclaim the forgiveness of God uh, for those who have experienced the consequences of abortion in this world, who've even pursued abortions in this world. God is forgiving. Let's announce that forgiveness. And also, let's try to work for good in the world so this evil can be uh, removed from it. And in a similar way, we also, as Christians, ought to address the legal and the systemic issues that relate to racism. Just as we want to change the legal and systemic issues that have to do with abortion, should we not also, Grimke would say, want to change the legal and systemic issues um, that have to do with racism? In other words, the church's love for neighbor leads to temporal goods. And then as the church scatters into the world, the church exercises great influence, even temporal power, in the pursuit of those temporal goods. Um, but how do we do that with wisdom? How do we do that uh, effectively? <laughs> well, to really uh, share with you the principles that Grimke developed for engaging effectively in partnerships and social activism, uh, I'd need to take more than the 45 minutes we have this morning. So I'll have to wait for another time. Uh, or maybe when we get done with this book, uh, maybe you can um, check it out and you can read more about it. Um, for our purposes here this morning, as I move towards the conclusion, I, I just reemphasize that Grimke believed that the distinction between the law and gospel and hanging on to both of them, preaching the gospel, but also announcing um, God's law was central to the ministry of the church. And then um, as the church uh, goes out into the world, um, the church can be an agent uh, for change. So I want to reiterate those two main points and also point out that Grimke's call to engage racial issues was almost exclusively 
grounded in Christian principles. It was his belief in God's word that gave him the heart to want to engage those issues. And uh, it was Christian hypocrisy in regards to race that was one of the biggest obstacles that Christians in Grimke's day faced uh, when it came to actually being able to communicate the faith uh, in a way that didn't seem like it was filled with hypocrisy. If people claim that the gospel is for all, <laughs> but then they live their lives in a way that doesn't play that out, why should anyone believe in them? And so I hope that there's um, something there for us to think about today. Are there ways in which we as Christians today in the church are living um, that might be putting unnecessary obstacles in front of the gospel? And in particular, as we think about racial issues, uh, Grimke would challenge us to continue to think about that question because his, uh, his, his desire was that the church would repent of its hypocrisy in order to be a more fic- effective witness for the gospel in the world. Uh, one final thought that I'll leave you with um, You know, the debate about the relative importance of abortion on the one hand or racial issues on the other uh, is an important conversation to have, but that debate often misses something that's really key. Uh, And that is that when Christians uh, talk about abortion, what they're doing is they're crying out about an evil that's out there in the world, which is important and something that we should be doing. Uh, When it comes to racial issues, though, that is a problem that's out in the world, but it is also a problem that has um, not just been in the church, but in American church history, and in particular in in Presbyterian church history, it's, it's a problem that's been in our own house. And so if we want people in the world to take us seriously, uh, then I think Francis Grimke would call us uh, to think through the ways in which our own house is in order. Um, and to look for ways in order to get it in order so that we can be a more effective witness in the world on a host of issues, um, including race and abortion and many others. And so uh, I hope, if nothing else, this uh, reflection on the life and ministry of Francis Krimke calls us to believe the gospel more deeply and dearly, Um, To know that the forgiveness of sins is something that gives us an eternal hope. Because we possess that eternal hope, we desire to live more effectively in this world, more faithfully in this world, and in particular to have a heart um, to to deal with and rectify and address racial issues. Uh, (laughs) One of the stories that Grimke told in his own writings relates to this desire to address and deal with hypocrisy and, and to grow in faithfulness. Um, he said, a boy was asked whether his father was a Christian. And his answer was, yes, he's a Christian. That's what the boy said. Yeah, my, my dad's a Christian. But he's not been doing much about it lately. And Grimke said, that's what might be said about the great majority of professing Christians. And it will account for the fact that so little is being done to bring others into the kingdom. It's because while professing to be Christians, they're not doing much about it. Not only at some particular time, but at any time. They are doing and doing every day, but it's the things that they're doing, it's not in the direction of the kingdom of God. It is of themselves and of their selfish interests that they're thinking and for which they're laboring. And the result is a leanness of soul, a steady falling away from the things that are true, just, pure, lovely, and of good report. So if this is true of us, let us arouse ourselves and to begin to do better. Uh, My prayer for myself, um, for you, for us, is that Francis Grimke's life and ministry would challenge us all to be more thoughtful about how we can love God and all of our neighbors in this world so that we can be a more effective witness for the gospel and better agents for change in this world. So it's been a pleasure to share this with you. And I hope it's encouraging to you. Uh, Greetings once again from West Charlotte. And thank you for the opportunity to share. Uh, It's good being with you. Amen.